So, uh, welcome everybody to uh, Fourth Friday. My name is uh, Dwayne Davison. On behalf of the VEC, welcome to everybody here. And uh, I know a few of you have lost a bet. That's why you're here, but welcome anyway. Um, if you are here uh, for food, check. We've got some uh, excellent uh, Middle Eastern food for you a little bit later. I uh, want to mention to you, um, of course, our signature event coming up. And uh, just so we know, uh, the music's still on around here. Oh, I have, I have a sign for it Yeah. Be able to turn that uh, off there? Yeah. Thanks. Sure. So uh, we are going through our third recording. We almost have it down right now. Uh, we are trying to uh, record, who knows, maybe live stream later. Uh, we've got a lot of requests for that. And um, uh, if you go to our Facebook page and our website, you'll see that uh, Spain is up and India is up for recording. And uh, we'll have this uh, uh, tonight as well. So um, yeah, our signature event, World Cultural Festival, of course. Uh, that's Sunday, September 17th, downtown Central Park Plaza. I mention that because uh, we are meeting now. We're wanting uh, volunteers. We're wanting suggestions. Uh, we need uh, cultural organizations to join us. If we don't know about them, uh, please let one of us know. Um, and uh, one of us, in this case, just real fast, uh, Hugh is uh, on our board. Say hi. Richard, uh, say hello back there. Uh, Mary is over there. Uh, Manakshi is over here. Hi, Manakshi. Uh, Kevin is in the back. Uh, yes, so uh, board of directors, myself, we would appreciate you guys suggesting anything from food to uh, music entertainment groups to um, cultural organizations. So uh, we also are looking for volunteers, of course, ahead of time and day of. So uh, we're all volunteer, uh, 501c3 nonprofit. And so uh, that's our signature fundraising event. So we can, uh, among other things, put on programs like uh, tonight. So I uh, want to let you know that um, uh, our first, uh, come on over if you like, uh, plenty of seats over here. Um, I want to let you know that uh, normally when your uh, wife says, uh, oh, I met a guy online uh, today, um, it's kind of, okay, well, I don't know if I want to hear this, but, uh, but that's how we actually met Hassan originally. Uh, he, uh, he came in uh, January with a wife and a young, December, right, before <laughs> right before, I thought it was right after, right before Christmas. Uh, he came in uh, first time coming to Valparaiso, uh, a wife and a young son in tow, and had nothing except pretty much the clothes on their, off their back. And uh, so my wife organized a bunch of stuff for him and, and welcomed him in, but uh, literally that's how they, uh, how they met or how we met originally. Um, maybe you have a different take on that. We'll hear, uh, hear your take on it. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, that's how we met uh, Hassan. A anybody who has a similar story, please let me know. We've got a few people lined up for the future here, but um, uh, if there are folks out in the community that we don't know about that uh, would be a good candidate to present on their country, always looking for that. Uh, you know, the thought is that uh, uh, the diversity that uh, folks like Hassan brings to our community is, is awesome. Um, you know, uh, you're going to have some nice smells tonight from the uh, food. Um, I always love listening to accents, although it's embarrassing. His, you know, he speaks five languages, and you'll see um, English is just uh, no problem whatsoever. I mean, how, how many of us can say that? Uh, so folks like Hassan... Uh, who's a medical doctor, but yet he works at the student union at Valparaiso University. Just uh, setting up catering type events and cleaning and all that. So, I mean, um, unbelievable uh, what folks will do to provide a better life for themselves and their community, right? While he's going to school. 
<laughs> while he's going to school full time, and he will tell you about that in uh, healthcare management. But uh, his uh, wife is from the uh, Republic of, Geor uh, of Georgia, and um, uh, Tecla is here uh, tonight. You'll have a chance to, to see everybody afterwards. If you are here for the first time, uh, just want to make sure, welcome. Uh, we love having you guys here, and uh, part of our mandate is that you stay and socialize afterwards. So we have food um, uh, for you, and uh, you'll be able to talk to Hassan. And uh, if you can, hold off to questions towards uh, the, the very end, unless it's absolutely uh, urgent. So um, anyway, we will be back for question and answers, but uh, please welcome uh, Hassan to the stage. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure being here. I, I want to thank Duane and Frida very much for everything from the beginning. And I'm hoping by the end of this, you'll be wow. We didn't know that. <laughs> That's what I aim at. So I won't be having a lot of pictures about myself and wife because I was just really busy gathering the pieces about Iraq. There's a lot of history. Even me, myself, I didn't know. So there we go. Uh, the first picture, this represents Hammurabi time. This is the Babylonians. Iraqis were obsessed with fighting with lions because <laughs> they were the strongest animals in the kingdom, and they wanted to prove they were stronger. <laughs> so OK, let's go with the location. So let's make something clear. Iraq is not Iran. It's different. <laughs> um, so Iraq is located here in the map. We are bounded by Jordan, Syria, to the left there. From the north, we have Turkey. And to the west, we have Iran. And down there, we have Kuwait. And that's the Persian Gulf, or the Arab Gulf. Um, here you notice the two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. They come from Turkey and from Syria. And they contributed a lot to the history of Iraq. So um, 65,000 BC, they found there were some Neanderthals in the north of Iraq in some cave. And Mesopotamia history just starts from 4,000 BC, so that's like 6,000 years ago. Um, the word Mesopotamia means uh, between the rivers. And that's basically the, uh, the two rivers I spoke about, uh, the Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, Baghdad actually has a history of 10,000 years ago, uh, 10,000 years. Uh, we celebrate that as, a, and as an old calendar. Um, just something to think about. All right, so the, we have four main cultures that lived in Iraq. We have the Akkadians, Sumerians, Babylonians, and which ones? <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah, three. So Sumer was basically the origin of everything that happened in Iraq. And so many things started in the world from Sumer. I'm going to try to go to pictures here. I'll, I'm going to keep it here, and I'll tell you about Sumer. So uh, Sumer started approximately between 55, uh, sorry, 5,000. 500 years BC and 3,500 BC. Somer started the trade by using the river and used some small boats for transportation. And Somer actually was the first civilization to exist. Some actually think, like there is a conflict between Egypt and Iraq, which one was first, including the writing. So the writing actually started from this place. It's, it's the capital of Somer. It's called Uruk. And that's actually the reason why Iraq is called Iraq. It comes from this word. Um, so the first written words were kind of like the emojis we use in the phone now. So we kind of went backwards. Uh, if, you, if you wanted to write a bird, so that's the original picture, and that's how they write it in cuneiform, which is the, the, uh, the language that the Sumerians used. And then this is the Ashurians, and this is the Babylonians. 
Um, Babylon is mentioned in the Bible, I believe. And there is a story to it. So here we have a fish and same thing. Um, so the reason why it looks, um, so in, in the Sumerian language, they used, to, they used to use a rod kind of, and not a hammer, kind of rock, a stone, a strong one. And so many people are wondering why old languages, they write from right to left and not left to right. And the reason is, when you hold a hammer in your hand, you will be you will be doing it from right to left because most of the people are right-handed, right? So you will be going this way. You can't actually go this way, right? So that is common with Hebrew as well because it's an old language, just like Arabic. We, we are kind of cousins language-wise and genes as well. <laughs> okay, uh, one more fact from Sumerians. You know why it's called honeymoon? Who invented honeymoon? So, Moon, we know it's a month, because Sumerians, Babylonians, they were using the lunar can calendar to basically navigate through the years and, and months. And the honey comes from a tradition that the Sumerians had, which is if you get married, your father-in-law will prepare liquor made from honey for one month. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hope you had such a honeymoon, all of you. <laughs> Um, also worth mentioning that the time system we use now, the 60s, was actually invented by Sumerians as well. So they decided that the minute is 60 seconds and the hour is 60 minutes. Also they had something called the royal drink, and that was beer. <laughs> so much alcohol, right? <laughs> Yes, so they, they fermented uh, some of the crops they had and they came up with a drink, they called it a royal drink because most of the royal uh, kings and let's say prince at their time, they were drinking that and it was actually at some points were, uh, given as a salary for workers. So you could actually get either money or you could get beer. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it easier. Um, let me just go back here. All right, this is the place uh, that actually was vis visited by the Pope of the Vatican uh, just recently, I think last year. Um, it's a temple, basically. Um, so we have in every city in Iraq a civilization, a culture, a temple, something that is no less than 5,000 years old. Um, there was a lot of focus on media and other things, but we'll get to that. <laughs> so this is, this is actually a clay. This is kind of their paper at that time. It looks like an iPad, but like it's. <laughs> um, so they, they had schools, and uh, people were really educated at, back then. They invented the way of irrigation, um, which kind of led to the collapse of their civilization because they had some droughts and they were using the canals. So they used to open the water from the river and it goes to their lands and that ended up drying all the resources they had. Um, so this city was actually populated by uh, approximately 80,000 person, which is a lot back, for back then. Um, okay. Um, these are one of the kings of, uh, of uh, Sumeria. And have you heard about um, Gilgamesh? Okay, the odyssey of a, of a king who did not want to die. So Gilgamesh had a best friend, Ankido. Gilgamesh thought to be half man and half a monster. A very strong king who did build a great city, great walls, gave the people all they needed from salaries, from services, they had cleaning, they had crafts, they had everything. And then he reached a certain age where he realized nobody that he knows is lasting forever, everybody dies. And he wanted to live forever. So his journey started to find the cure for death, the immort the. Uh, the mortality uh, plant. Uh, Gilgamesh went, he fought some monsters in the jungles, he killed some beasts, 
Um, and then in the end, he, uh, he found the plant eventually. He was very sleepy, so he just took a nap real quick. And a snake came and ate the medicine. Then we have this logo of pharmacy and medicine. And the reason is the story of Gilgamesh. So the Odyssey was the first written literature, literature in the world. There is nothing we have that is documented before that. And they kind of say the history started from Sumer. So every writing um, and every event that happened, we get it like from Sumer. We don't, we don't have written facts before that. They even spoke about Noah and the flood. Uh, they mentioned that there was so much water, people had to go to the mountains and hide. Um, so they recovered most of it. It's in the museum. Um, okay. Now the next culture, which is Babylon. So um, Babylon had the most famous tower, which was 91 meters. That's approximately 300 feet, I believe. And the story of it was that guy who wanted to fight God. So he built a tower and he wanted to go on the top of it and you know, reach God. And that's why I don't know what it says in Bible, to be honest, but I think it's the same story. <laughs> um, so it was seven, 7th century BC. And it's, it is just amazing that the time period between us and the Babylonians is less than the time between Babylonians and the Sumerians. There's, yes. So Babylon, we have Hammurabi, which is the guy who wrote the first codes of laws, the 282 laws. They were supposed to be 300, but they didn't like specific numbers. They thought it was unlucky numbers, so they did not use it. And some of it was destroyed, so they couldn't, they couldn't recover all of it. Um, so in these laws, there were some of them that I studied in university. I didn't know a lot of stuff about back home. Um, <coughs> one of them was medicine. So they had masters and slaves, of course. Um, if a guy shows up to the doctor, and the doctor eventually injures that person and causes him to lose his sight, if that was a master, then the doctor should be imprisoned. But if that was a slave, then he would pay like two coins of, of silver or something. Um, so before that, like kings used to do whatever they wanted to do because they are the kings. Um, and Hammurabi kind of the one who came up with the laws, so it kind of become a democracy. There is law, people know their rights and, and what to expect. Babylon was also very advanced in military because they invented the wheel. So it made it easier for them to use carts and then put more soldiers in it, put more guns in it, swords. They also were the first to, uh, to use the metal. So they discovered iron, they used bronze, silver, gold. They used it in a lot of quantities to, uh, mostly for weapons to be honest, but like they, they had some jewelries, some, you see some of their carts. Um, they, they fought uh, with uh, Persia. So Persia is another empire next to us. And it's funny, it's been 7,000 years, we still fight, but <laughs> it's tradition now. <laughs> um, again, the lions. <laughs> Have you seen uh, the white lion in a zoo? No, I don't. It's originally from there, from Iraq. We, uh, my, my place where I live, it's very close to Uruk. It's 20 miles away. And it, the other name used to be the Whitey. That's a translation. And the, the word comes from the lions, the white lions that used to live in the area. Okay. Um, more pictures of hunting lions. All right, so we have Ishtar. She is the goddess of love and sexuality and thus fertility. She was the goddess of, uh, of love in, in, uh, in Babylon. And we have a great gate that is actually named after her. OK, sorry. I don't have the picture. Um, another one, 
the hanging gardens of Babylon. It wasn't really hanging, but it was gardens on other floors. So the idea of getting the water to that level was one of the miracles they had. And the king actually had all the, guard, uh, all the plants they wished for, and they managed somehow to plant things that they were not plantable uh, due to the weather. And that's why it became a miracle. Okay. Now, uh, ethnicity of Iraq. So Iraq is not an Islamic country. We do not go by the law of Sharia. There are currently two, recently three, countries that use the laws of Quran as, as the rules to, to manage the public, which is Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, and I think now it's Afghanistan. But we do not have that. So we have a secular government because we have a population of Turkmen, Assyrians, Yazidis, Armenians. Uh, we have also Shabak. Uh, even the, the Muslims themselves, we are divided into Sunnis and Shi'is. Um, Kurds are a huge, a huge, uh, a huge part of Iraq. Um, the total population now is about 45 million, and that is the people who live in Iraq. So I don't think they have a correct statistics on the people who are abroad. Um, too many people in the recent years due to, to the politics and circumstances that happen in Iraq, they migrated to other countries. So um, majority now is Shia Islam, 61%. Sunni Muslims are 34%. Christians are 3%, other religions are 2%. The middle part of Iraq to the south, that's all Muslims. From like Baghdad itself, as it's located in the middle, it has uh, a fair population of Christianity, churches. Uh, Kurds are to the north. Kurds are located in a region, they call it uh, Kurdistan. It used to be a country which I will get to in a moment. Uh, this is the cave, it's called Shanidar, and these are the skulls they found of Neanderthals in the Shanidar cave in the north of Iraq. Um, it's not all desert, so don't be surprised that they're green. <laughs> uh, there are waterfalls and amazing places, especially in the north of Iraq. And here we jump to politics. Um, let's start from here. So Iraq was not a modern country by the year 1960. Modern I mean by having borders, documents, papers, even though there's a lot of history. The reason is the whole Arab nations were kinda like the United States, like they are states, but there are no borders, people are marrying each other, they have relations, they go, they go do trades, but there were no borders. Um, 1916s, there was the Sykes-Picot, Sykes we call it Sykes-Bico. Sykes we have issue with the P and B, so if you hear me saying that, just <laughs> don't mind it. Um, so, um, Muhammad was the prophet, and he was kinda a king uh, when we speak legal wise and who has the power and authority. And after Muhammad, there were four people that took power. There was Omar, Uthman, Abu Bakr, and Ali. Ali is the guy who most of the Shia follows, all of the Shia follows. They believe he is the right ruler. And from Ali, there was the family of Hashimians, they call them, the Hashimites, because the whole family of Muhammad is called Hashim, his, his ancestors. So uh, the, the designated ruler for all the Arabs was the Prince Al, uh, Hussein bin Ali, that's his name. He used to live in Mecca. This is the first king, actually. This is Faisal. Um, so by the year 1916, it was the Ottomans who were controlling the, the area. And uh, due to the whole wars in Europe and everything, the Brits, the France, I don't know who else was there exactly, but they wanted to divide the whole region, divide and conquer style. 
So they promised the Arabs to get their freedom and give them their one united land if they helped them beat the Turks at that time. So they had a deal. They worked on fighting the, the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire lost. The whole nation was happy. They would get their one land. And then that was the year they discovered oil. So, <laughs> so they, uh, they decided to stay a bit longer <laughs> and decided to divide the region. So there, the, then we have Kurdistan as well, the Kurds. They used to be um, just a huge land in the north of Iraq with, I will go to the first picture with the map. Um, and they shared, so Kurdistan is like there, and it's part of Turkey, Iran, part of Syria. Um, they also lost their lands, they were divided. So they were like divided on four countries. And Kuwait, for example, it's been a very controversial since that division. Um, everyone says it belongs to Iraq, others say it doesn't belong to Iraq, and hence we had a war. Um, so the, uh, the Brits had a deal with Bin Salman at that time, who is one of the founders of the Saudi Arabia. They promised him a land, they promised him the country, uh, and a lot more, if he would help beat the, uh, the, the Arabs who were trying to rule, which were the, the royal family of Hashemite. Um, so he, he fought, and he became the president, uh, king actually, and that's how Saudi Arabia actually existed. Um, and then the sons of the prince became kings in Jordan. Now we have the king, uh, the Hashemite king. I think his name is Hussein bin Ali as well. Yeah? King Abdullah. Abdullah, okay. His, his son is Hussein. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the other king, uh, the other son became a king of Syria. He was assassinated. Uh, the other one went to Iraq. Um, which is this one? He didn't last long. They had a, a coup against him, and then and then we had the second king, Lawrence of Arabia. He was a British intelligence officer who worked in the Middle East at that time. And he fell in love with the culture and the nation. He actually was the person who's defending the Arabian dream in politics. And he was, uh, he, he was pushed away from politics and he had to quit because everyone thought he was a traitor. He stayed too long with the Arabs. And now he shares the same visions with them and the same goals. Uh, there is a book actually about him. It explains his visits and uh, he, he spoke the language and he knew the culture, he knew the Quran, even though he wasn't an Arab, but he was an important figure in history. So we had the first Faisal Awal, the first Faisal, second was Ghazi, and the years are kind of funny because like we had so many military coups. Um, so the first king lasted from 1921 to 1933, Second one from 1933 to 1939, and then from 1939 to 1953, 1958, then 1962, and then here there was, till the time Saddam became in, came to power, there was a government change in every six months, approximately. So there was never, peace in the region. I, I believe personally it's just because of the oil. Okay, now we'll talk about, I guess, the war in Saddam. When Saddam became, came to the power, uh, there were a lot of politics happening with Iran. As Iran declared that they are Islamic government now, after the Shah came the, um, the Ayatollah of the, of the government. Um, so that was threatening Iraq because they, they had a goal of expanding their existence, expanding the message of, of Islam. Um, so Iraq had to go through a war which is listed as the longest war in history. 
except for bacteria and viruses. They fight forever. <laughs> From the 1980s till the 1988. At this time, before the beginning of the war, uh, the one Iraqi dinar was equivalent to approximately four US dollars. By the end, by the 1990s, the one dollar was approximately 1,500 dinars. Um, we didn't lose land, we didn't gain land during the war. It lasted eight years, no gains. Uh, they just, yeah, they just go back and forth. So many people died, approximately half a million Iraqi and the same from the Iranian side. Um, and since then, Iran had some influence in Iraq because they, they kind of saw it as a revenge. Um, eight years, it cannot just go by. Um, many of the fighters who fought in Iran were exiled from Iraq by Saddam. So ha Saddam had the no toleration policy. If anyone had anything to say in the government or just stands up against him, he will be just exiled from Iraq. Especially if they had some roots in Iran, they will be sent to Iran. So sadly, so many of the Iraqi, uh, let's say, not revolution, but like the other side, the uh, people who did not accept Saddam terms and rules, became soldiers in the Iranian army and fought against their own brothers. And then after the war, they went back home to Iraq and they became prime ministers, presidents, ah, so. Then by the end of this war, everyone was happy. Okay, we're done with war, great, we're back to life, let's start building, and no, Gulf War. <laughs> Gulf War lasted from August 2nd, 1990s to uh, 1991, to February 28th. Uh, this happened because Iraq was in debt. We had a war going on for eight years. The whole Gulf area, the other countries funded us in, in a type, uh, in, as loans, basically. Um, the Gulf countries dropped the loans. They, they saw it as we were fighting for them, sp stopping the expansion of the Persia into the Middle East and the Arabian countries. But Kuwait didn't. And there was uh, some fluc fluctuation in the market with the prices of oils. Iraq needed a lot, a lot of uh, foreign currency income by selling the oil. When the prices dropped because of the war, the, uh, the, the, the union of the oil selling companies decided to reduce the production by a specific number. Kuwait did not commit to that. They did not want to sell less. Um, Saddam is a guy known for not thinking politically. He's a guy of actions. So he had a call by the evening after an argument they had in the parliament, the Arabian parliament that night. He called the prince of Kuwait and he said, tomorrow we'll have breakfast with you. The next day, the whole army was in Kuwait uh, announcing that it is the 19th city of Iraq now. Um, then, the, there was the, uh, the worst economical crisis, uh, sorry, the ecological crisis. Uh, Saddam burnt, burnt the oil of Kuwait, mm. leave, leaving the whole region dark for like six months, <coughs> acid rain, um, until they left Kuwait, and this is what they call the street of death. This is between Kuwait and Iraq, so that's basically the Iraqi army retreating from Kuwait but the, uh, the coalition forces had orders to take these uh, armed vehicles down. They didn't want Saddam to have that power. Otherwise, he would probably come again or invade other country. <laughs> okay. 2003. Um, when 2003 happened, I was 10 years old. I was back home in Iraq. Remember my parents preparing some wood so we can just cook something in case the lights goes off. Um, in my city, where we live, in the south, Samawa, I woke up in the morning, people were celebrating, everyone was happy. 
people got some breakfast to the American troops. Uh, anyone who knew some few words in English were talking to the Americans. Everyone was just saying, hi, mister, hi, mister. That's it. Um, um, people saw it as a hope that the country is finally now liberated from Saddam and all of this uh, obsession for power and control. Um, so we didn't have issues in the beginning. It was easy. Um, even Baghdad, it took only three days, I think, after the war and it fell. People were super happy and here's an example. A guy giving a flower to a female soldier. Um, then after that, we had the 2006, 2008. It's a, it's a crazy period of influence of regional countries. Saudi Arabia, the <coughs> per Persia, Iran, um, some other countries in the region. Uh, we had some racism happening and sectari sectarianism. So Sunnis and Shias, they were fighti fighting each other. And um, most of the people at that time, they actually had two ID cards. So one that has the Sunni names and one has the Shia names. But like, you never know who are you facing. So it's still <laughs> difficult which one to show. <laughs> um, uh, it was dark, but again, Iraqis went through it and survived it with so many explosions, approximately 56,000 bombs exploded in one year wow. during that period. Um, yeah. Then you see like nothing actually stops. Even, even though like we have a lot of trage tragedies happening in the, in the country, um, TV shows are usually just comedies. Everywhere people go, they just want to talk, laugh, um, enjoy life. I, I don't think any country would still be happy after everything that happened, but they managed to pull through. This is a picture of the visit of the Pope of Vatican to Mosul. This is the, uh, the uh, Church of al Tahira. it's called, the, the uh, pure saints. That's the translation, I believe. Um, and, you see, and you see through the destroyed walls, they, they had this lovely meeting that gathered all the religions back then. Muslims, Sunni, Shi'is, Shabakis, Yazidis, Mandais, everyone, they, they were gathered. This is just recent. I believe it was uh, three years ago. Now, um, so Sumerians, when they lived in the region and they used these type of boats, they also made some houses from the reeds that was in the region. So they, they chop the weed um, and then they make these shapes with it. And they use it as if it was a pillar to build a place. And we still actually have these places in our culture, even though it's a tradition of building it goes back to 6,000 years ago. Um, people come, come there, there is a sheikh sitting at the end. He is the, big of his, the biggest, not the biggest, biggest is that, the oldest or the wisest kind of leader of the tribe. And, and people come there, they, we sit on the floor, basically. There is a lot of coffee there. Um, and people bring up their issues and the sheikh will try to fix it. People who need some financial helps, the sheikhs probably will be able to provide that. Um, so this is basically where people meet. It's like a, it's like a non-religious church. Um, this is from modern day. This is the Martians of Iraq. Martians. Yeah, Martians. Um, people still live there the same way the Sumerians used to live there. They basically have their cattle. They have the buffaloes. Um, and they are very disconnected from the world. And this is a site that is protected by the UNESCO World uh, Heritage. Um, we have so many, so many tourists recently going there, um, swimming, taking pictures. These are how the houses look like. It's Venetia of Iraq, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
just a couple on a normal afternoon. Uh, they also fish a lot there. Um, that's how simple life there is. That's the buffaloes. Um, so they make uh, something we call qaymar. Uh, it is, it's kind of the butter, but since it's taken from the buffalo, it's a bit different. It's white more, and they add milk to it. And that's everyone's breakfast there. <laughs> now religion, again. So this site is Karbala. Um, so remember when we spoke about how the power was supposed to go through Muhammad to the four leaders, then through Ali? Karbala has two of Ali's sons, Hussein and Abbas, buried there. Um, they were basically promised to be the leaders of Iraq, and they came to Karbala with their families, and they were betrayed by the locals back then. And they, were, they, they uh, were killed there and they were buried there. So now so many Muslims from all around the world, uh, probably uh, five to eight million visit the shrine every year. Uh, there are huge events happening. They call it the 40s, which is the tradition of uh, mourning someone. Uh, so 40 days after the, their death, uh, there will be uh, a meeting where they will read some of the holy book for verses. Uh, they will be donating some food. So they still do that after 1,450 years, approximately. Um, it's a beautiful site. Um, there is a lot of Islamic, um, how do you call that? Yeah. Um, so you have gold, actually, that the, 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 uh, the dome is made of gold. Um, and then here you have the Islamic architect. Um, there is a lot of drawings, and it's very complicated, especially the glass. I've seen them putting the glass piece by piece. Like, they, they just cut it like finger size, and then they, <coughs> they glue it there, and they make these amazing shapes. Um, this is silver and gold in the middle. That's the name of uh, the daughter of Muhammad, Zahra. Um, and this is the shrine. Uh, basically, this is the tomb itself. And they have a fence, so people go there and, uh, yeah, okay, I'm gonna have that one. Um, and just ask for something like wishes or like prayers or something. Um, so there are three pr places like, like this one. There is Najaf, four actually. Najaf, we have one who is the leader, one of the four. His name is Ali. And then in Karbala, there are two for his sons, Hussein and Abbas. And then one of their descendants, al Kadhim in Baghdad. So Shia people visit these places. Sunnis, they have other places like uh, the old mosque of Mosul, or like Abdul Qadir al Gailani in Baghdad, uh, who is a guy who uh, liberated Palestine at some point in the history, 100, 120 years ago. Um, this is one of the nicest mosques and the biggest in Iraq, in Mosul. Um, I, I believe this is the one that ISIS took and announced their Khilafat from, because it has a simple. Like, they took the biggest one, so they're in power. Um, this is the one that was supposed to be built in, in Baghdad. Uh, this was a project of Saddam. Uh, I think he was going to repent at that moment, and he started to build something like that, and yeah. But it never finished. It's been 20 years now, and it's still at this stage. Then we have the Zakura, we call it. It's in Samara. Uh, this, is by, uh, this is the time of the Abbasin. Um, so they, they came after the whole thing happening in Karbala. And they were the, ru the Islamic rulers of the, of the region. And this, is what, this was basically the place where they were saying the prayers. So you know how Muslims have this call for prayer? 
a guy used to climb the stairs every day and goes there and he starts calling for prayer and we complain about the elevators now, they took so long. <laughs> Um, then we have one of the biggest churches in Iraq, in Baghdad. Um, this place sadly also was attacked, of course, by terrorists in 2008, I believe. But it's just amazing how people live there, especially now. If people could go to Iraq and see how people are like, they love each other, they, not, they don't have racism happening, they understand the value of each other, we have a democratic system. But we still suffer from the corruption as these people who uh, were exiled by Saddam turned against the whole country, came into power and became ministers and presidents. And they were just abusing the office for their personal gains, um, sending a lot of money to Iran, especially through the sanctions that we, they have now. I believe that's how they survived, to be honest. Otherwise, I don't know. Um, okay, this is also Mosul the biggest church that I showed previously. This actually was uh, renovated after ISIS when they were defeated in 2017. Then we have the Zoroastrians. The Zoroastrians are believed to be the oldest religion in the area. Uh, their practices are, are usually uh, combined uh, with fire. There should be fire during the practice. We have uh, Zoroastrians in the north part of Iraq. There are not so many, but I'm happy that I know one of them. He, uh, he was in the university with us. He's a pharmacist now in Iraq. They believe in three things. Good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. That is all, the good stuff. <laughs> um, 1200 BC, that is their symbol of the religion. This is the prophet, uh, and, and he believed to be like an angel, so he had, since he has the wing and the shape of a bird. Um, yeah, they believe like they were, the, uh, they influenced actually the religions that follows. Like, if you notice, they believe in three things, and Christianity comes believing in the Trinity. Um, so there is a connection, I believe. Anyways, um, that's one of their, uh, their, how do you call it? Like prayer sessions, ceremonies? Sermons. Yes. Um, they always have the fire in the middle. They have like a new year, and they celebrate all together with food, feasting. Um, yeah, that is one of the temples in the north. This is from Iran, because Zoroastrians are called in Arabic um, a word that repre represents all the, uh, all the Iranians. So basically it was more in Iran by history, but some parts of Iraq were, were also Zoroastrians. Um, this is the Iraqi dance, the traditional one. They call it in Iraq Chobi. In Syria they call it Debka. Um, it's basically holding hands and just walking to the side like one step at a time. The first one in the, in the, in the line is the person who leads the dance and usually they have um, some kind of a necklace, <laughs> like the one, the one that has uh, beads in it and they, yeah. Um, this is one of the uh, celebrations of another group. These are the Azidis, also one of the old uh, religions in Iraq in the north again. Uh, most of these religions are now in the north, uh, and the, these people I mean, because it's safer to be in the north as it's uh, a federal government and they have their own rules, their own police, their own ministers basically. So if someone needed to migrate from a dangerous region, especially during 2008, they would go there to the north of Iraq, Kurdistan region. Food, uh, falafel. You will be trying some of it today. Um, it's a very common, very popular, very basic food uh, that cost approximately, uh, I would say now, like 30 cents. Um, so it's usually served with a special Iraqi sauce called amba. Um, 
it's yellowish and it stains your hand forever. <laughs> is it spicy? No, it's not. We, we don't eat spicy. Like it's, it's not common, no. They used to call it mango sauce, but when I went through it, I actually discovered that it has nothing from mango. <laughs> yes. Um, I'll, the na yeah, the name is strange to me, so I'm going to pull it from Google Translate. Um, that is, I'll get it. Um, yes, so what else we have? We have masgouf which is an old way of preparing fish. And I believe it goes back also to the Sumerian time. So it was basically crack open the fish from the back and not from the belly side. Um, they don't wash it as they believe the, the blood has a taste to it. So, <laughs> so yeah, so they don't wash it. And since it's going to be on fire anyways, it should be safe to eat. Um, and it, it's going to be exactly like in the picture, standing around a huge pile of fire. Uh, it takes like half an hour, an hour, it depends. But it tastes delicious. Like this is the best thing I think in Iraq if you would go after falafels, of course. Um, and the cost, again, it's, it's not expensive. It's, it's, it's not. Like uh, if you compare to the US, with one meal here, you can eat a week there. <laughs> so <laughs> you can. <laughs> You can. Uh, he's also Iraqi, by the way, so he's doing some fact checking here. <laughs> if you go to fancy places in Baghdad itself, uh, it's really expensive. Like, even the taxis are really expensive. But usually, people don't like, not everyone lives in the center and in the fancy region. So, like, the, the other cities, you can get falafel for 500 dinars, which is 33 cents to be exact. But in the in the fancy regions in Baghdad, you will get it for 2,000, which is a dollar and a half, I think. Yes? That sauce you were talking about, turmeric, I believe, is the substance in that. It is. It is. It is. And the other one is the, the thing that gives it consistency is fenugreek. <laughs> yes, that's, that's the smell of it, actually. Um, fish again. That's the carp. We eat carp, mostly. That's how it's served, usually with some pomegranate sauce, um, pickles, onions, and Iraqi bread. Another food we have is called kubba, uh, which, is, uh, which is, it could be rice, and it could be uh, <laughs> Um, it could be potatoes as well. It could be potatoes or rice, yes. Um, and it's stuffed with meat. And funny thing, meat doesn't mean chicken. <laughs> so chicken is chicken, meat is meat. <laughs> OK, um, so this is with meat. It could be with chicken. Uh, yeah. Um, it could al we also have the dolma, we call it. Uh, so many countries, I think, uh, especially in Georgia, Azerbaijan, they call it dolma as well. Um, it is basically the grapes, leaves. They've been processed in a way, makes them easier to, to eat and digest. And they will be stuffed with rice and meat. It could be chicken as well, <laughs> beef and chicken. Um, <laughs> also, I heard a new fact about the shape of this bread. This will, you'll like it. So this bread, we call it in Iraq, Samun. That's literally how we pronou pronounce it. Nobody knows the history of it until I dicked about it. And I realized there is someone from Georgia, where my wife is from, migrated in Iraq a really, really long time ago. His name was Simon. <laughs> and he was making the Georgian bread. The Georgian bread is very similar to this one, but it's like this size. This one is like this, a sandwich. Um, people were buying it, and they started calling it Samun because Simon was serving it. <laughs> and it became popular then. Um, we also have Mahshi, 
which is which is the literal translation stuffed. So any uh, vegetables that can be stuffed, like we have here, the uh, zucchini, I believe, the uh, onion, uh, the bell bell pepper. Yes. Yeah. We have makluba. Makluba its translation means flipped upside down, <laughs> which is that's how they prepare it. So they put the heavy stuff down there, the things that need to be fried, and then they put the uh, rice at the end on the top, which needs to be steamed, and then they just flip it. So um, then we have shawarma, which we call it gus. Gus means cutting, and that's how pr they, they serve it. It's very delicious. I wish I could eat some of it here, but <laughs> not tonight, I guess. Um, this guy, Qasim Abul Gas, he's in Baghdad. He's a very famous place, a very ancient place. I think they've been there for like, what, 50 years now? Um, through generations, this picture is very old. Um, it's served either on bread or in the, in the same Samun, Simon. <laughs> Then we have the, uh, the uh, flava beans rice. There is also the uh, biryani, a different version. Uh, India has a spicy different version. Iraqi is a bit different. As they put the meat in the pan and they fry it, that it becomes crispy at the outer layers. And it's served like that with some nuts. Iraqi kebab. Um, very famous, we eat that for breakfast. Um, so the Iraqi breakfast is very controversial. Uh, people eat meat in the morning. Like, we don't have, um, it's, not, it's not very common. Yeah, sheep head, which is called bacha. I think I have a picture of it, I hope so. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I, will, I was just trying. Um, then let's talk about some famous Iraqis. So we have Zaha Hadid. She, is, she was an immigrant from Iraq to the UK. Uh, she passed away recently. She has an amazing designs. I think probably you would be familiar with the one in Azerbaijan if you visited there. Um, I think it's that one on the left. Um, so she is now, uh, her, she gave a project to the Iraqi government before she passed away to build the Central Bank of Iraq. It's still under construction. It's going to be an amazing project. Um, there are so many Iraqis abroad, and that's why I guess they took so many positions now abroad because it's been years of escaping Iraq since Saddam time, and till now it's like what 40, 50 years. So uh, we have Omar Al Rawi. He is a, a parliament member in Vienna. We also have Rim Al Abdali, your cousin. Um, <laughs> Uh, Minister of Immigration in, uh, in Germany, uh, Al Zahrawi, Finance Minister of the UK, uh, and so many other, like uh, the one who designed a specific car for BMW, I cannot remember that, but like he was also Iraqi. And that's me, me and my dad. Um, so my childhood being through politics, through wars, I don't remember much of it because I was a kid, my dad took care of us. We were seven, five sisters, two brothers. Um, this is actually the, the shop where I used to go and buy candies and sweet. And my dad tells me not to go there. And I just tell him, I'm sorry, I can't resist. So <laughs> he took a picture there that day. Um, I went. Your little boy looks just like you. Yes. And I look kind of like my dad. <laughs> um, so 2003, I was in Iraq, uh, did my high school, then went to India, uh, wanted to study medicine in India. I lasted in India eight months. <laughs> and then I uh, heard about Georgia from our Kurdish friends uh, because based on their location, they are closer to Turkey, so they have more knowledge of Georgia. Personally, me, I, I thought it's Georgia, the US, but I flew somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the year I graduated with MD from Tbilisi State Medical University in Georgia. Yay. Thank you. Um, I met my wife in 2014 in Tbilisi. 
So it's been nine years we're together now um, in the university. Um, that's the hospital team. We were students and uh, now everyone is at, at some country. So we have Embra in Turkey. We have Maryam in Egypt. Ghada, she's in Canada. Uh, these two girls worked, went back to India. Um, you, Muhammad Yusuf is serving in the Turkish army as a paramedic. Uh, Selma is working as a cardiologist in Egypt. Um, it's all, of, all around the world. I'm very glad that I did actually study in Georgia. It's, there is infinite number of cultures and, and nationalities visiting there, just because it's located close to Europe, close to the Middle East. So it's kind of the meeting point. Um, so yeah, basically I have friends because of Georgia everywhere in the world. And then we were lucky to have Adam, um, 2020. So he's a, a COVID baby, yes. <laughs> uh, um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, sir. I, uh, I don't want to brag too much about my alma mater, but uh, uh, Hassan is a student at Mount Brisbane University. Uh, he'll finish uh, in about a week, one semester. Yes. Before we met him, and uh, just before Christmas, uh, shaky grasp of the English language, uh, didn't know a whole lot about uh, his home country. Uh, very timid, couldn't present. So less than a semester later, that's what we have. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome job. Right Thank you. Um, all right. So we, uh, I think, have some uh, questions already. But first, yes. I do want to hear, uh, since we have two Iraqis in the house, uh, <laughs> could you guys speak, uh, just tell us, about your day or whatever, just speak in your native language. Um, okay, I'll try to prevent myself from saying anything that has Allah, 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 Allah lit. Shlawanak, shahwarak. When should it be? When? Okay. Louder. No, okay. Um, so we start with always with Sheku Maku, which means what is there, what isn't there. <laughs> What's up, basically? Uh, okay. Yalla Mara Thani Aid. Sheku Maku, Abdullah Shahwarak. Alhamdulillah, Khandi Shahwarak. Alhamdulillah, Tamam. Tamam. Hello. Hey, I'm sorry. 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 Dialogue, like the Iraqi dialogue, so it's a little bit different than the original Arabic. So what, actually, let's say something in Iraqi dialogue and then say it in Arabic. Okay. And, and so, so they can see what the difference is. Okay, I'll say it in the Arabic, okay? okay. You do it in Iraqi. Yeah. Um, no, no, the same thing oh. but in Iraqi. Okay, say it. <laughs> see the difference? Yeah. <laughs> it's completely different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that enough? <laughs> uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that because we kind of speak different languages in the Middle East now. The book language is the original Arabic. Everything official is in Arabic. It's the same in all the Arabic countries. But we speak very different. So we end up learning all the other countries' languages because we watch TV, we have connections and friends. We speak all the language, we understand them, but it's different. So a uh, loose translation of their conversation was, uh, can you believe Americans thought that they worked for beer? <laughs> so, didn't know that that was you guys. Yeah. So, all right, I'd like to open up uh, for some questions here. So, yes, young lady. Well, Dwayne, thank you, Dwayne. Oh, young lady, okay, you got that? <laughs> but anyway, I kind of have three questions. Yes, sir. Number one is, how are women treated um, in, in your country okay. versus America? Another one is, are Christians still persecuted? Okay. And the third, third one is, would you ever go back and live there? Okay. Those are great <laughs> questions. 
Yeah. yeah. So uh, we are out of time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, thank you for coming. So, all right. Do you want to answer all those three? Yeah, it's, okay. it's gonna be simple. Good luck. Um, so Iraq is is different cultures as well. So uh, we have the Bedouins. Um, there are people who live in farms, and they usually need everyone in the house to do the work. These might oppress women by making them work. Uh, women actually have the right to vote, just like men. Uh, we have people in the, as ministers and parliament members who are females. Um, we, uh, we also have now, just recently, so many females are working in offices. Um, it, it, it's not it's not like it's oppressing women to be honest because like so many cultures have their rules that works best for them but wouldn't work for others I think you can see some examples through life from there so women in the in the Middle East and in Iraq in specific now um, treated with they can get whatever they want just please don't go outside some families do that like don't don't mix with men outside so in the recent years it's more liberating. Baghdad was always free. No one, we don't have a, the rule of wearing hijab or covering head, never. So everyone is free to choose what they want. Um, so now I would say it's a very small chance for women to be oppressed at this, at this time. Um, Baghdad, I think never, north of Iraq, never. It's just the south part because they are more farmers and Bedouin as we call them. Uh, second question about Christians. Um, Christians were never oppressed in Iraq. The whole fight was always between Sunnis and Shias. It's always. Um, we, uh, even like in the household when, where I grew up, my mom always used to tell us how friendly Christians are and how good they are uh, and how <coughs> faithful they are. Um, she even sometimes says they're better than our comrades, like something like that. Um, the third question about going back to Iraq. Um, I am between three countries now. <laughs> I used to be between Georgia and Iraq, now the US, Georgia and Iraq. Uh, I have a lot of memories and connections back home, but it just, for the time being, I cannot make a decision. I hope by the time I finish my study, the situation will be better so I can go back. I wish I could, yeah. Yes. I was reading my uh, 1991 National Geographic map. I brought my, my maps with me. And the question I have is it said that Iraq was the largest non Arabic country in the Middle East. What do they mean that it's non Arabic? Does that, does that make sense to you? Okay. Um, so the Middle East, I think there are two answers, uh, two points. The Middle East, the, the whole Arabic people, how do you become an Arab is through your father. Your father has to come from a tree line that goes back to the region where the first Arabs appeared. And that is the peninsula of Arabia, which is the Dubai, uh, KSA, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and like this kind of peninsula. So most of the people have origins to there. And the Middle East, let's say Saudi Arabia. Um, they don't have Christians anymore, so they are 100% Arabs. But in Iraq, it's non-Arabs, a lot of non-Arabs, uh, which goes back to some of them are coming from the roots of Sumeria, some of them go back from Assyrians, uh, which is Babylon, and I think that's why they are called the major non-Arab country, because no one else has the diversity we have in, in the Arabic countries. Yes. Uh, as uninformed Americans, a lot of the talk we've heard over here is the difference between Shias and Sunnis and why they're at odds. Okay. Can you explain a little bit about that? Okay. Um, in reality, there isn't a huge difference. It's basically like Catholics and Orthodox. Okay. But it's been used by politics because Iraq is located by Sunnis, which is Saudi Arabia, and the Shias, which are Iran. And both of them saw an opportunity to include Iraq in their lands after the 2003, as the whole government was disseminated, if that's a correct word to use. Um, so they saw a chance, and then they flicked the conflict 
there were some funding happening to both sides to take uh, control and take the power. And that's why they were just clashing. But no big difference. <coughs> Now, no, there isn't there anymore. Is no, no, now nothing. Water. Yeah, it was time ago. Are you familiar with the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago? I, I think they've changed the name recently. Uh, they, a lot of, you, you know, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think much of the, the museum is dedicated to uh, Mesopotamian uh, culture and so forth. I didn't so, know that. Uh, they changed it. Recently, now so they're no mo, no longer going to call it Oriental Institute because some people found it offensive kind of thing. So okay. They have a much longer name now. I see. <laughs> um, don't be shy to ask about any specific things. When, when you were in India, did you encounter any Zoroastrians who we call Parsis in India? There are a lot of Zoroastrians who migrated there. Actually, yes. I, I did meet some friends there who were Zoroastrians. But I, I wasn't aware. I mean, India has how many religions, right? So I wasn't, I wasn't aware like they were in the region, in, in like Iraq specifically, until I went to Georgia. But I did meet two of them, actually, in the university. Yeah, we call them Parsis. Yeah. They yes. They from Persia. Yes, yeah. yes. The majority of them are, yes. Where were you in India? Bangalore. Bangalore. Yes. I, uh, I was at Rajiv Gandhi University. Dr. Hassan, how, how did you wind up in Valparaiso? <laughs> 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 Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a Google search. <laughs> it is. I'm actually very, very happy that I made it to Valpo. I, my experience is very different than my friend's experience in the US. And I think it just thanks to all of you for being so friendly and open-minded and very helpful since the day I got here. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> so a Google search and for Veil of Paradise. Yes. I had no idea what I was going to expect. I, I had no expectations. I, I just thought it's going to be like the movies, New York, tall buildings and stuff. I arrived here and just houses are like, oh, okay, that's uh, that's simpler. <laughs> um, but yeah, really, I'm like, from the first day, we met a guy in the airport. Uh, I actually found him on Facebook, and he was waiting for us for two hours in the airport. And then it, he dropped us at the motel here in Super 8, and he didn't take anything. And that was just the beginning of it. And then I was so lucky to make some contacts with Abdullah. Um, also, he, he offered to sign a lease, even though I don't even know him. I met him the first day. Wow. Um, so many people. Um, if I don't mention them, they are not less important. Uh, speaking of uh, Veil of Paradise, uh, <laughs> those of you who have come the past couple of times, we've gone over Valparaiso and the origins and geography and that. So the question was asked, what was the oldest Valparaiso? So I, I looked that up, did not find an answer, but I did find uh, that El Mercurio, which is the Spanish language newspaper in Valparaiso, Chile, is the oldest Spanish language newspaper in the world. So uh, that almost answers the question, but that's the best I could come up with. So. <laughs> Would you have the name of a restaurant in Chicago that would serve such delicious food as you showed us? Any Iraqi restaurants? Or where uh, can we get any of it? OK. Uh, um, <laughs> Chicago, I heard Bridgepoint. They have a lot of restaurants, Arabic restaurants. I myself still look in, in Chicago, but I would recommend going to Dearborn in Michigan. Um, it feels just like back home. I, I'm sorry, but you lost the state. Michigan is not American. <laughs> um, everything is in Arabic. They have Arabic radio stations. It's just like, so yeah. You could, you could make a small trip and. What are you studying now? Uh, health administration. Yes. No, I'm just, I'm just so happy to be here.
Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if I missed this, but how big is Iraq? Like, is it compared to Illinois or Texas? Or? Uh, it's the size of the state of California. Concerning how Americans feel about the Middle East and in terms of understanding and appreciating the history, the knowledge you have, look how many languages you speak, how many rights of one. Um, and, and I you know there's a lot of things about our judgments that we miss out and you know all of the things that there are is to know and to benefit from that again, even though there's a lot of common humanity around the world. Do you feel like there's an openness to uh, a growing growth of acceptance and uh, interest in what's really going on in the Middle East and the uh, history of the country and, and you know, the area and all that? Um, honestly, most of the people wouldn't know anything about the Middle East besides the war. Um, so I wish the media <coughs> would focus on the positive things to raise the awareness. Um, but I feel most of the people and I think including you guys here, uh, when you hear about the history, you're just like, wow, we didn't know that. Um, so that is, that's the goal for me doing this today. I just want to show that there is a lot in coming with Arabs or Iraqis or humanity in general. Like we share the same values. We invented the same things back then. Um, I think there is a lot of openness now in the Middle East towards the West. Um, hence, we all speak English now, like my, uh, my nephews, my younger sisters, they speak English fluently at home. And that's thanks to Hollywood, it's like all the words they get from movies. Uh, um, I, I want to believe that it's going to get better in, in this term. So, yeah. I have another quick question. Yes. Of course. When you showed all those people at the, the hospital that you were yes, working, and yes. you said that everybody had different languages. Did yes. you understand each other? Yes, I, I, we all speak English, so my oh. study was in English. Um, in, in everyday life, we use Georgian or Russian, because Georgia used to be a Soviet Union country. Um, I understand some Turkish because of my Turkish friends who are in the class. They always speak Turkish for some reason. They didn't want to speak English. <laughs> um, uh, Egyptians, um, that's how I got better at uh, the Egyptian language. I, even though I watch it in movies, but it turns out it's harder to speak it. Uh, German, because I went to Germany and I did some uh, internship in Essen Clinicum in Essen. Um, yeah, so. It's an international place. That's it's it forces itself on you. Yeah. Uh, so I was just going to ask, like, um, back in Nigeria, we have a lot of Muslims. I'm sure you know from that. Um, they are called Aousas. So you mentioned something about um, the women not going out. They also do that back uh, in northern Nigeria. So I wanted to ask, like, you mentioned Iraq is not like traditionally Muslim, right? It's mm. like Muslim nation. That's what you said. They like. The whole Arab thing, it was a fight between Sumer Sumerians and the Arabs. Oh, okay. And that's how Arabs moved to the area. And then Islam, you know, came like, what, 1,500 years ago? Mm -hmm. so, so the question is, yeah. like, in, in that northern part of Nigeria, they practice polygamy, where a man can marry a Oh, okay, wives. okay. So do they do that in Iraq okay. too? Okay, got it. Um, uh, so polygamy was allowed till, I think, 2003. And now, if someone wants to marry a second wife, he has to write a request to the court, and his first wife has to approve it, otherwise he goes to jail. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> success for women. <laughs> the lady is going to give me the new name of the Oriental Institute. Oh, okay. I will, I'll take that. Okay. It's now called the Institute for the Study of Ancient Cultures, West Asia, and North Africa. Wow, that's a long name. <laughs> cultures. Okay. 
Anybody else? You mentioned that almost every village has some ancient monument, 5,000 years old. I remember hearing that a lot of, uh, there was a lot of destruction when ISIS was there. Is that, can, is still a lot that survived there? Yes, um, so ISIS destroyed a lot uh, in the museum of Mosul, but uh, turns out some of these artifacts were not actually the original ones. They have the original ones kept safe. Plus, anywhere in Iraq, if you dig, you either get oil or something old. So, <laughs> so like, I don't think we should worry about that. We have a lot, don't worry. <laughs> Right, so uh, you know that's why we bring uh, folks like Hassan here to in the flesh meet them at, uh, 20 years ago. Maybe we just look on TV and think, uh, oh, that's our enemy. But uh, he and everyone else we bring before you proves that they're humans. They have families. They uh, they love their uh, neighbors and their country, and uh, it, it's just uh, always awesome to see people. In, uh, in person, so we always uh, appreciate folks like you coming, and making you our place uh, better, and uh, so welcome to Valpo. Thank and, you. And uh, we are going to now have um, some treats, and uh, before um, I let uh, Hassan tell you what they are exactly, please remember if you enjoy this kind of thing, we have an email list uh, over there if you're not on it. We'll send you emails on our events like this. Uh, we also have a website and a Facebook page as well. Uh, we are recording this and we're hoping that uh, tonight we got it right. Our thanks to Tom for uh, doing all the work on that and Kevin helping them out. Um, so anyway, uh, if you could just uh, tell us what we're eating. Okay, so I have one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so we have baklava, uh, which is an Iraqi, Turkish, Middle Eastern sweet. It's, uh, it's very, uh, very common in Iraqi households to eat this kind of sweet, especially in the month of Ramadan, last month. Uh, we have also the falafel, which is uh, grinded uh, chickpeas with some parsley uh, and some flavors. Um, we also have hummus which is another chickpeas made differently. <laughs> um, some of the bread and an Arabian salad. Yeah. Very good, awesome. So, um, okay, one, one last and then we're, uh, we'll wrap it up. Can you tell us what's gonna happen next month? Oh, I didn't know the speaker, but uh, you're gonna have to come and find out. <laughs> yes. No, we, uh, we, we, we do know the speaker, but uh, you will be learning it next time. We do have, uh, in all seriousness, we do have uh, some people literally are coming and going out of the country. We sometimes have to change things the last second. So, uh, but with that in mind, uh, remember if, if there's any candidate uh, that lives in Northwest Indiana, we welcome them to, to come and, uh, and, and present here. So. Um, thank you very much for the presentation tonight. We're gonna thank you, everyone. Yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming.